John 15 a little bit later. So if you want to make a note on that, you may be a little bit sooner. So we're in Galatians chapter 2, uh, chapter 5, verses 2 through 6. And the Bible tells us this. This is Paul speaking. He says, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by a law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor circumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. We can stop there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us to fully understand our justification is from you alone. We ask that your Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit when we are falling away from the message of grace. And we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope in our glorification one day. So we ask that you would teach us to express our faith through love and let your word manifest itself in our lives. And this we ask and we pray for our Lord's name. Amen. Well, this is a letter to the churches of uh, Galatia, uh, where these Judaizers were troubling the Galatian church. And these Judaizers were teaching that Christians needed to keep the law of Moses. And they needed to be circumcised along with that and to keep and observe special holidays and uh, seasons. And Paul was arguing against that. As he's arguing against this, we see that Paul so far has given us five arguments in order to defend that it is by faith alone, through Christ alone. First, he gave us a personal argument. And a personal argument was their personal experience with the Holy Spirit. He said that the Holy Spirit has now indwelt you and he wants to know who bewitched you. Who bewitched you? Because I've clearly colored a beautiful picture of Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. So who has bewitched you? Because you've experienced the Holy Spirit. You've, did you experience the Holy Spirit in vain? So that is his question. And then the second argument he has is a scriptural argument. And that scriptural argument is the testimony of the Old Testament. He calls up Abraham as his witness, if you remember. Now, we learn that Abraham believed, and because he believed, he was credited with righteousness. Jesus, who was the seed, was also a promise that was given to Abraham. And then he went further and he talked about Moses and how the law was delivered with smoke and fire and clouds and the fear of it. And even Moses shook at that time when he encountered it. But we also learned that that law was temporary and was unable to give life. <coughs> Thirdly, he gave a practical argument. He practical argument was how they, they become sons or an heir of God. And he explained it to them, it's through faith in Christ. And all of them were now baptized into Christ. They were clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that all are one, Greek, Jew, male, female, it didn't matter. They are all one underneath Christ. There is nothing more, no one more special than the next one. And the fourth argument was a sentimental argument. He was, Paul was appealing to the, to the Galatians. He said, don't observe these special days. Don't be a slave to uh, gods who are not really 
And he said, you welcomed me at that time as though I were Jesus Christ himself. And you would have plucked out your eyes for me. And then he ends that with, am I now your enemy? So he's making a sentimental argument about women. He's using their relationship that he formed. And then the fifth one was an allegorical argument. And that, if you remember, involved Hagar and Sarah, the free woman, the bond woman. And then he had a comparison of Ishmael and Isaac. So he had free woman, slave woman, and he had the law being Ishmael and also Thomas, which was Isaac. So Paul used these five arguments in order to reason with the Galatians. And now Paul, he's going to go back, back into chapter 1 a little bit. If you remember in chapter 1, Paul had to defend his being an apostle. He had to defend that. Because the Judaizers are saying that Paul is not a real apostle. He was not one of the original twelve. So here Paul, in our text here, he's exercising his authority as an apostle. He testifies that there's consequences of trusting the law. Okay? So as he gives this testimony about, his, about being an apostle, when you read our text, it's almost like he's giving an oath, right? So, here's what he says. So, what are the consequences of trusting law? That is the question that we're going to discover today. He says in verse 2, he says, You will not profit from Christ, right? You will not profit from Christ if you trust in the law. If you become circumcised, which was the Jewish law, it demanded that all men become uh circumcised and that law though was only given to the Israelites if you remember now that was known as the covenant of Abraham and Abraham had become circumcised when he was 99 years of age and then after that all the children would become uh, circumcised on the eighth day after their birth so Paul wants the Galatians to know that circumcision was not a salvational act it did not increase any of their spiritual life. It didn't make them any holier. And it didn't make them any closer to God. So it was just a law. What he wanted to do is let them know it should not be done with the idea that it was done for their justification, right? We don't do this in order to become justified. The proof that we read about was Titus back in chapter 2, verses 3 and 5. Now, if you remember, Paul met up with uh, Peter and John, and I believe it was Timothy. And they were discussing, remember the church pillars at that time, is circumcision needed for salvation. And all of the church pillars gathered together, and Paul wanted to compare notes, and they all agreed that circumcision was not required for salvation. So much so that Titus, who was a Greek, didn't even feel compelled in order to get circumcised. And, and so all these pillars agreed together on that. Now, when we start looking more at what are the consequences of trusting in the law, it says, Christ will profit you nothing. What does that mean? Well, as a believer, that should be pretty much a terrifying statement, right? That Christ would profit you nothing. It means that maybe you were believing for nothing. You put all your eggs in one basket. What he's talking about is that you're never going to experience the blessings that Christ provides the believer. Okay? You know, you know, experience the forgiveness that we have through Christ's blood. You'll never discover the riches of God's grace that he lavishes on you. Because when you if Christ profits you nothing, you lose. You lose even the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
and you lose your inheritance. The Holy Spirit, though, is our deepest guarantee of our inheritance. So those are all things you lose. And you also lose the power that God provides toward the believer. You lose the power of the, uh, the resurrection. You lose that Christ is no longer on the right hand of God, right? All these benefits are lost if you go to the law. Now, Christ, if you remember, he was placed above all rulers, all authorities, his, uh, all powers, dominions. His name was placed above all names. Everything was placed underneath Christ's feet. And he's even head over the church body. So when you don't recognize Christ and Christ alone, those are all the blessings and the benefits that you no longer profit from. Now, there's also the loss of being the privilege of being in God's family, right? You're no longer foreigners, you're no longer strangers, but you're now, as believers who have received Christ and faith only through Christ, you are now fellow citizens of the, of, of the kingdom, right? You're fellow citizens of God's kingdom. Now that foundation was built upon apostles, it was built upon the prophets, and Christ was the chief cornerstone. And that's where the whole building was put together, right? So all these blessings of Christ offer will not be offered to those who follow the law. So another thing is that you'll be indebted to the law. Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 through 3 of our text, they say, Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. So Paul is demanding with his apostle like authority, apostolic authority, I think that's the proper word. He's saying, mark my words, pay attention to what I am saying. This is very important. You will be a debtor to the law if you follow the law. If you want to dot every T, every I, cross every T, you're going to have to do that when you follow the law. You're basically, you're going to be tying yourself, you're going to be handcuffing yourself to the law. You have to obey it continuously without failure. And that's a heavy burden and it's impossible. If the entire law were not followed, you become cursed, right? You're underneath a curse of death. Galatians 3 verse 10 tells us that. It says, for all that rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So if you stumble, if you stumble in one area of the law, you're guilty of breaking the law. You become a lawbreaker. The old covenant of blood of goats and bulls was inadequate, right? And it remains inadequate now. All these things that I've spoke about entangle you back into the yoke of bondage. So you have to stand firm like Paul told us in our freedom. And then Paul continues with the consequences of trusting the law for salvation. He says, you will be estranged from Christ. That's not good, is it? I hope that never happens. All of Israel had attempted in the past to 
be justified by the law. And they failed miserably. The Judaizers were no different. Even though they had believed that the Jesus was necessary, but they also mixed that with the law, right? They were failing also, just like Israel did with just the law. So they had failed to attain this goal. And they were stumbling. They were falling over a stone. They were on a dark path, if you can imagine that. And we can see that when, in Romans chapter 9, verses 31 to 32. It says, But the people of Israel were who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. <coughs> Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if, as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So when those who seek to justify by the law, you're going to stumble and you're going to fall. It's an impossible task. So if you can imagine that there is a dark path and in this dark path that you can't see anything, you're stumbling and you're falling on these stones and rocks, right? You're in the darkness. In the darkness, there's no light. Uh, you just are lost and you're unsaved. And that deals with all men before they were uh, given the light. So if you can make a comparison with that, with the light. So when you become estranged from Christ, you're severed from Christ, it says, right? You're alienated. Christ has become no effect. It's kind of a confusing uh, statement that Paul is making here. It, but it's still similar to the, to the comments that Jesus had made. They told those uh, to the disciples. Jesus told them they will not, what, bear fruit. They lost their first love. And they told them in Revelations that you're lukewarm. Jesus and Paul were both addressing Christians. He says, you will fall from grace. So who's going to fall from grace? Because Paul was addressing Christians. Well, you might jump to a conclusion that he's talking about um, losing your salvation, but that's not what he's talking about. Paul is addressing Christians. And these Christians felt that circumcision and law were necessary. But we all know that law can't justify anyone. Romans 3.20 tells us that. It says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's eye, at sight, by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we became conscious of our sin. So, you who attempt to be justified, that's what he says. You who attempt to be justified, you have fallen from grace. Paul is stating very clearly a possibility of abandoning the message of grace here. Paul, like I said, is speaking to the Christian. They received the proper gospel when Paul was with them, and they came to salvation by grace when Paul was so when Paul says, you have fallen from grace, it points out that there was at one time you were here with grace. And when you have fallen, you have left a certain place and fell down. You went to another place. You cannot fall from something unless you were there, right? And if you're already down here at the law, you can't fall any lower than that. So you had to be at grace, you had to fall back down. And that's what they're doing. So Paul is warning the Galatians of a great danger. There's great danger when you are following the law. So stop it. Mark my words. This is not good for you. Now, a lot of people, us included, I'm going to have to say, are sometimes tempted to fall from grace. There must be some times in our lives where we go, oh, is faith alone enough? 
is faith and works the way to go. What's right? You know, I want to be covered. I want to make sure that I have eternal salvation. I don't want to run that risk of being God, so I will do both. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do you trust Paul or do you trust the Judaizers? And I hope that you trust Paul. That is by faith alone, by Christ alone, by grace alone. It's not by, if it's not by Christ alone, if it's not by grace alone, faith alone, this is what we're told in verse 4 then. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. Severed. Okay, that's another word. You have been severed from Christ. Now, this is where chapter 15 fits in. Remember when we went through that parable of the vine and the branches in 15? If you would turn to chapter 15, verse 1. Now will help clarify what Paul is speaking about. Paul says... I'm sorry. Jesus says in John 15, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will become even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So, alienated from Christ, severed from Christ, just like that branch, right? We're talking about a branch that had no fruit on it. It was dead. It looked like it was part of the brush, but it wasn't. It means being separated from Christ. So, Paul, he's suggesting that that person in Galatians is not fully trusting in Christ. Those who fall away from Christ, they're, they fall away from grace, right? They're not fully trusting in Christ, just like the Judaizers, right? Their faith wasn't complete in Christ alone. It's also in the law. So that Judaizers had, were a very good example for us here. They confessed Jesus, but they added on works, and they perverted the gospel. There's no salvation in a perverted gospel. That's Paul's argument. So much that he even said twice before that you would be cursed if you perverted the gospel. He said it not once, but two times. So the desertion of Christ in the gospel proved that that faith was not genuine in the first place. Does that make sense? So that's a lot today, wasn't it? So here's what I want you to understand when we walk away. If you're going to follow the law, there's terrible consequences in trusting the law. Christ is not going to be of any profit to you. You'll be a slave of the law because there's no salvation with that. There's no life in the law. There's no forgiveness of sins in the law. You're severed from Christ and you're fallen from grace. Those are all the things that happen when you walk away from grace alone. So we need to not be tempted to follow and trust in law. Because when we do that, we're trusting in ourselves. We have deceitful hearts. I keep saying that over and over, right? We have deceitful hearts. Do not trust in yourself. You have to remain faithful to Jesus. You have to stand firm and enjoy the blessings of salvation.
your sanctification and your glorification. That's what we stand firm in. So it remains standing firm in the grace of God is what I'm trying to say. And the question I'm going to end with is, are you trusting in Jesus or are you trusting in Judaizers? I hope it's Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that our deceitful hearts are purged from all self-told lies. I pray your Holy Spirit will cleanse our hearts from all unfaithfulness and our darkness. Help us to submit our lives to you and listen for your promptings according to your perfect will. We thank you so much for your Son. We thank you for our salvation, our sanctity and that great hope of our glorification. Thank you for justice.